screen. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, this is a joint talk with myself, Robert L. Reed, and James Butler of Helpful Engineering. Uh, I'm going to get started. I appreciate all the people who are here. This is the Inventors Gathering. We meet every third Thursday. Um, we've begun to put these up on YouTube. If you're interested in seeing future talks, you can find it at Eventbrite. Let me try to share my screen. Ah, okay, I can see your faces, which is good. Can everybody see this and hear me? Okay, the title of our talk today is Supply Chain as a Humanitarian Responsibility. And James Butler and I have been working on this because we have produced um, software systems, as well as other people in, in, in the audience today, um, that start to think about the supply chain and elevating it to um, a level which perhaps has not been fully articulated before. And that is the level of a humanitarian responsibility which becomes universal. Now, this is a little grisly, uh, but how do you really harm a lot of people? If you really want to hurt a lot of people, you deprive them of a supply chain. Now. The word supply chain is a very non-glamorous technical word, but it means the way we deliver material objects to people in the modern world. And so the easiest way to kill a lot of people is to deprive them of clean water and medicine. Now, you can also deprive them of food, but it takes a lot longer for people to die of starvation than it does to die of cholera or a lack of drinking water. So an extension of this idea is that you can break other critical links in a supply chain in any way you can. That's really the most effective way to harm a large number of people. Generally speaking, throughout most wars, germs kill more people than bombs and bullets. The Holocaust and a few other massacres have been exceptions to this, but generally speaking, disease kills more people than uh, direct attempts at violence. A few people are joining here. I'm letting them in. So by extension or inference, how do you love a lot of people? If you want to love a large number of people, the best way to do it is to make sure that they have an unbreakable supply chain of their very basic needs. That is the most effective way that you can protect people. So I wouldn't deny you air. So if I denied you air, I would be a strangler and I would go to prison for that. So by extension, why would I deny you water or medicine or shelter or food? Now, Americans think in terms of rights. We're, we tend to think in our legal system about rights. You do have a right to free air. In the United States, you do not have a right to free food. You do have a right to free speech, but the right to free speech is socially constructed. So... The, the point of this talk is, should we socially construct a right to free drinking water, for example, and perhaps other material needs? So we want to think globally. If it is possible and we are not doing it, how are we not murderers? That is, if it is possible to provide drinking water to everybody and we're not doing it, does the moral charge of that make us any less than a murderer in the sense of if I deprived you of air, I would be a murderer? Now, I would argue that throughout time, it has not been possible for me or the United States to provide drinking water to everybody. Throughout time, the United States didn't exist. But in general, humanity's ability to provide for other fellow beings has been increasing tremendously over time and exponentially. 
when it's not possible to do something, we don't associate any moral culpability with it. If I don't have the ability to provide you clean drinking water, I obviously have no moral uh, uh, imperative to do so because it's not within my power to do it. But as it becomes more and more in my power to do it, it becomes more and more a question of, do I have a duty to do it? Now, this is a, a moving target in the sense that our, the wealth of humanity is always increasing or has been for a long time. I know young people listening to this who have student loans may not believe that, but it's, it's statistically extremely true. We have far, far more wealth and ability to do simple things than we have ever had before. And I would argue, although that is not the point of this talk, talk that it's not even terribly expensive. So for example, human household water needs are absolutely dwarfed by agriculture. Okay, um, in Tanzania, I've worked on a project that's trying to get 20 liters of water per day to a household. The smallest garden in the world takes more than 20 liters uh, a day in, in terms of water. And so roughly speaking, when you, you think about American scale agriculture, drinking water and household use water for washing your person uh, and washing your cooking utensils is just tiny compared to any agricultural need. Um, shelter can be mass produced. Medicine is expensive to research, but generally cheap, cheap to make once you know how to make it. Now, in America, the reason medicine is expensive is that the cost of the research is amortized onto the marginal cost of the customers. If that link were broken, for example, if the US federal government gave a billion dollars to someone who came up with an anti-cholesterol drug or a anti-cancer drug or open heart surgery or developed the first X-ray or the first MRI machine or the first computer-aided tomography machine, uh, and that was sufficient financial incentive that there was no need to make a profit on the extension of that medicine as a marginal cost for each person that would do it, then um, medicine would be much cheaper. So what we should ask, what could we do as a society with minimal expense? We could also change the question, say, well, what could we do in general? But let's just ask, what is the minimum expense that we could do? And I propose that we can construct a universal right to clean drinking water. This would not be expensive. And we can also construct a universal right to basic emergency medical care. Other things such as food, shelter, clothing, heat are more difficult. They're more expensive to present. And they're also relatively less important. They're, you still need those other things, but they're less important than clean drinking water and basic emergency medical care. Now, obviously, when I say medical care, I do not mean Viagra and liposuction and rhinoplasty and cosmetic surgery and that, that kind of thing, right? There's a whole scale of medical care. And what I'm talking about here is basic emergency medical care, which means treatment and prevention of infectious diseases, which are easily treated, and... Um, treatment of recoverable wounds sustained from natural and man-made disasters. Now, what does it mean to elevate this to the level of a human universal right? We, it's very easy to say those words, and it doesn't really mean anything to say those words, okay? But what it, when it starts to come into force is when people are held accountable for it, right? When you say... Um, if I deprive you of that right, I am committing a crime. Now, obviously, usually one individual does not deprive another individual of a right to drink water. It happens at a social level, not at the, not me locking up Megan and preventing her from drinking a glass of water. That does happen, but it's very, very unusual. Um, we would call that kidnapping, right? Uh, 
what I'm talking about here is a larger scale, but nonetheless, we could elevate it to the level where we say, if, if a society does not provide clean drinking water, it should be held accountable in that way. So how does this relate to the ideas of open source, right? Uh, public invention is sort of fiercely open source. Open source medical supplies is also open source. So by the way, is helpful engineering. The open source system or, or the ideas, they don't really talk about it exactly this way, but roughly speaking, they say you have the right to have the know-how for building certain things. Now, what things? It started with software. Why? Because the marginal cost of producing new software is zero. It's expensive to write software, but once I've written a program, I can make it freely available to the entire planet for 10 cents. It, it costs almost nothing to distribute software um, and it, therefore, it was very reasonable that it become the first thing that becomes uh, subject to a universal right. Should a universal right be extended to material goods? Obviously, we can't all have a universal right to a Lamborghini, but we could say you have a universal right to clean drinking water. Okay. Now, um, in a sense, the universal right to know how, which means to know how to do things or technology, which the words actually mean the same thing, is already occurring. It's, it's already the case that this is happening. And believe it or not, the U.S. Patent Office is an example of this. We normally think of the U.S. Patent Office as, in its negative connotation, that is, it produces a monopoly on know-how. It gives a legal monopoly to someone who is the first to file a patent and be granted a patent under certain legal conditions. But it's important to remember that that comes with a bargain, that that monopoly is temporary and it is only granted in exchange for revealing or in the language of the US Patent Office, teaching how that technology can be used. So the patent office is in fact an ever growing database of freely available technology that anyone in the world can search and use at any time once the patent has expired, which is 20 years from the point at which it was filed. But nonetheless, every year new patents are added, but old ones expire and they permanently stay in the database. Therefore, there's a permanently growing body of know-how, which is becoming more and more sophisticated over time. But no matter how much know-how you have, no matter how many lasers and microchips and microwave waveguides and all kinds of other crazy high-tech stuff you can do, it doesn't violate the conservation of energy. You can't make clean water out of nothing. I can give you all of the technology in the world and it won't give you clean water by itself. It might, in combination with energy, allow you to purify water that you have, but by itself, it does not provide any material benefit. Now, um, I recently had the pleasure of reading the UN Declaration of Human Rights. It consists of 30 articles. The first 24 are about equality and freedom. This is article 25. Everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of himself, sexes, and his family, including food, clothing, housing, and medical care. The emphasis is mine. And necessary social services, blah, 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 et cetera. Motherhood and childhood are entitled to special care and assistance. So it is actually the case that there, it is part of the UN Declaration of Universal Human Rights that you have a right to food, clothing, housing, and medical care. This has some meaning in the world, but not much. Okay, how can we make it have more meaning? Well, the only way to eat an elephant is one bite at a time, right? 
what we should focus on is water first. The United Nations believes you should also have food, clothing, housing, and medical care, but clean water is the easiest to provide. And yet we, meaning both myself, public invention, and also American society, which I strongly associate myself as an American patriot, are not providing this on a worldwide basis. We're not even providing this to our own citizens. We certainly don't provide housing in this country to our own, own citizens. So we want to act locally. Um, okay, so what, what can we actually do? And of course, it's, it was Buckminster Fuller who, who created the slogan, uh, think globally and act locally, right? Well, that's kind of what this talk is about. So how can we affect the supply chain for normal people? Or, or across the world? Well, public invention is sort of trying to work in the research space of the supply chain. We're trying to research new things that make it easier. But that's only the first part of the supply chain. It's almost before the supply chain begins. Helpful engineering, or helpful, is also doing development in the same space. Open source medical supplies, which are could be represented by Victoria and Christina, who are here in the audience, focus more on manufacturing and distribution, especially during the um, pandemic. But they also have a library of designs. So you, you can think of that as organizing things early in the supply chain. But in a sense, open source medical supplies is operating after what public invention and helpful are doing. Now, one of the projects we're going to talk about today, Global Distributed Tracking, um, which is an alliance of many um, nonprofits, which I spoke about previously in other talks, so I'm not going to go into it too much uh, now, deals with more with vending and the ability to control quality and to report adverse events. That represents a further portion of the supply chain, which is closer to the end point where something is delivered to somebody, right? That is more of a sort of inventory tracking and delivery part of the supply chain. And project data in particular, which James has worked on, um, is software in support of the entire chain. So what we are doing that may not have been articulated before now is we're building cooperating systems at different parts of the supply chain. Um, okay, so this is really um, James's slide, but I'm, I'm going to talk about it here. Um, so he, I, I, he may have had um, a loved one who experienced this. You know, during the pandemic, um, doctors and nurses were put at undue risk simply because they didn't have masks and and other kinds of personal protective equipment. Okay, um, and so James was made very angry by this. Right. Um, as an extension of that, the greater community was also put at, at increased risk by not supporting the front lines. And James has found this to be intolerable. And um, the the project data team, which he runs at Helpful Engineering, is attempting to be more proactive about this. And um, we've created a plan. Uh, we're currently using the name that Dale Doherty created, Plan C, which is a little unfortunate because that name is also associated with um, abortion in America now. There's a group called Plan C that's related to abortion. We have nothing to do with that, and that's not what we're, we're talking about today. Um, but Make Magazine and Dale Doherty created the word Plan C. We may need to come up with a better name. Um, Project Data uh, has written a, a very long, I worked on it, a 50 page green paper about how to access the entire supply chain. We have in fact submitted a paper to a supply chain uh, journal and um, project data is trying to extend this to a few targets. Um, designs for critical supplies defined by scenario mapping, um, the ability to map makers onto the supplies that are needed in times of extreme demand and matching makers to demand is really um, what this is 
um, what project data is all about. So we've project data, I happen to work a lot on project data uh, as well as public invention. Pro project data is not a public invention project. It's a helpful project. Um, the, the idea of our pilot project was to help connect people who have needs to the people who can solve them. And the example that drove a lot of what we were doing was fabric masks, which were needed to protect people from disease, but could be easily made by makers if we could find makers and buyers and get them together. And so what Project Data has done is created a framework for describing the tools that a maker has available and matching that to the kind of thing that can be made with the tools that they have available. Okay, and that includes a bill of materials. That's what BOM stands for, it's bill of materials. Um, and the fundamental adaptation strategy uh, which we have have implemented in some Python code. And Harry Pearson is here in the audience and he's done some of this work as, as have I, is the idea of substitutability. When can you substitute one supplier or one product with another? Now, that is not a particularly important question when your supply chain has not been disrupted. When, when you're making things in a giant factory, you don't have to worry about substitution. But as we know, in the pandemic, supply chains worldwide were vastly disrupted. That's why there were shortages of relatively easy to make materials like personal protective equipment. This could have been addressed if we had had a systematic way to perform substitution and to get a large number of makers or small manufacturers to um, make those products and a distribution system for it. And that is what um, the pilot projects that Project Data has been trying to do um, are attempting to address. Let me pause just one second. Uh, okay, so... Um, Well, uh, so one thing that we did was we were doing what we call a flash make, okay? And the idea of a flash make is to, like, it's kind of like a flash mob. It's on the spot with no premeditation, as quickly as possible, deploy a maker or a maker's space to make a highly needed item, such as a flashlight or a fabric mask or personal protective equipment. Now, we'll extend that later to a much larger idea. But what we've done so far was we made cookies. And so we made cookies and we transmitted them um, from my house here in Austin, Texas to Earl Fong house, who he lives in San Francisco. And he ate the cookies and said they were good. Okay. This, of course, may seem simple, but we did that with automated software based on a recipe um, that was described in a fixed format. Okay, now, as you know, in the in computer science, there's a famous book called Zero One Infinity, right? It, it, if you can do something repeatedly, you can do it an infinite number of times, okay? In this case, we made a cookie. We could probably make lots and more cookies, okay? Now, Eventually, we want to make something far more sophisticated and life-saving than a cookie. But if we, if we could deploy a bunch of people who don't know each other, are not in agreement, have not signed contracts, and instantly make a large number of cookies and get them to the people who really wanted the cookies, we would be doing something that hasn't been done yet, I think. So... This is based, some of this work is based on um, work done by another nonprofit organization called the Inter Internet of Production Alliance. Um, and they created a framework called the Open No Framework. And it has a number of components, including the Open Know How system, which is their most developed product, which is really the recipe or the instruction for building a device. 
And I, I, I'm not sure, but I think there exists maybe 25 open know-how documents in the world. And this is a machine readable format in, let's say in JSON, there are different formats that can be used here. And you, you might ask, well, so what? How is that different than just a piece of English text that describes how to make a cookie or how to make a, a fabric mask? And the, the real beauty is that by formalizing it and turning it into something tractable by a computer and readable, you can match it to an open nowhere, which describes facilities that can make an OKH device, right? So what you really want to do is take all the people who are willing and able to make cookies, who have an oven and flour and sugar and chocolate chips and eggs and butter and vanilla and match them to um, the recipe for making those things and say, okay, um, that's a pun there. Um, we have people who are ready to make cookies. We have a demand for cookie and we have instructions for cookies. We can get the cookies delivered. Now, that's just a little bitty baby action. But by turning it into software that is supported so that it makes it easy for people to join this network and participate, we may someday be able to do something really big with this framework. And that's what Project Data has been working towards. So the, the accomplishments that Project Data has so far actually accomplished are um, the creation of an improved format for, uh, that should say OKH, or, or maybe. Uh, well, we improved the OKH, and we also created the first format for the OKW. So we're building on what IOPA has done in, in doing that. We've created a matching algorithm for matching OKHs to OKWs. That is, matching makers to things that can be made, and finding what a given maker can actually make with the tools and items that they have on hand. We've created a little bit of a GUI, uh, a graphical representation for representing supply chains. This is kind of still a work in progress, but we have a way of making this real in the sense of visible to a human being so they can understand the supply chain. Now, when you buy something from Amazon, you don't have to think about the supply chain. You don't care where the product came from very much, and you certainly don't care if some part of it was made here and some part of it was made there and it was assembled here and then shipped there or if it was done in some other place. It's, it's simply not relevant to you. When does it matter? Well, when the world is falling apart, it matters a lot, right? When you don't have any other way to get a flashlight, it matters. When you don't have any other way to get food, it matters. When you need a blanket because of a tsunami has wiped out your house, it becomes very important. At that point, you're willing to expose the supply chain and think about it because your life depends upon it. Now, we don't imagine, of course, that every person is going to participate in this. Obviously, there will be people who will be buyers and people who will be acting on behalf of other people to try to meet human needs across a group of people. But those people will need to see the supply chain when the traditional supply chain has failed for them. And what Project Data has done is run an initial supply chain drill involving the cookies. And we're planning other pilot projects. OK, so to, to bring this back to sort of the moral foundation of what we're talking about, today you can take a Red Cross first aid class. I've taken one twice. I'm, 57 years old, I've taken, you know, I've, I've taken um, CPR classes on a number of occasions, right? I felt a moral imperative to do that because someday I may have to give CPR to somebody. I never have so far, but you never know, right? Why wouldn't I also in the future take a supply chain class? Like, how would it be different, right? If you really needed clean drinking water, or um, um, something else, how would it be different for me to deny you clean water than to not give you CPR if you needed 
Now, I should point out, in the United States, you do not have a legal responsibility to give CPR to people. Uh, like, for example, I'm I'm a proficient swimmer. If a child is drowning, I do not have a legal responsibility to jump in the water and save the child. But I have a moral responsibility to do so. And you can bet I would. And at the same level, why don't I think if you need insulin or a flashlight or a blanket, why wouldn't I do the, why wouldn't I treat it the same way? I would never let a child drown. Why would I let a child be cold because they don't have a blanket? So the other thing um, that, that I'm very proud of, but it's it's just beginning, and since we've already talked about it in this talk, I'm not going to talk about it too much now, is global distributed tracking. And that we use this for the first time in the cookie make, the flash cookie make. Um, the things I want to point out about this is that the US FDA, which of course, um, it, the US is only 1 20th of the world population, but many nations in the world follow the US FDA or the other what are called big five nations when it comes to health regulations. They are the United States, Canada, Japan, um, and Europe. Uh, so the European Union. So um, the US FDA is, is important because it's a model for many nations on, on how they do things. So um, it requires uh, that you be able to track something that you medically distribute for an intended use so that you can report adverse events. Now, it doesn't require perfect reporting. It doesn't require that every single person who gets a tongue depressor absolutely have a way to report if they get a splinter in their tongue or not. But you have to have some adequate way of doing that if you're going to if you're going to market a medical device in the United States and that's copied in many other nations okay it's necessary to be able to perform recalls not necessarily from a legal point of view but just from a moral point of view especially if we're going to have a ragtag army of makers making things the we need a quality assurance mechanism and the quality assurance mechanism has to include the ability to do recalls. The biggest, most powerful companies in the world have to do recalls sometimes. We're gonna have the same situation if in the moment of crisis, we expand the supply chain to include people who aren't normally part of the supply chain. Of course, we're gonna have to have recalls. If it's a choice between dying and having a product that may have to be recalled though, we should still expand, expand the supply chain. That is the fact that this will undoubtedly lead to low quality devices causing some harm in the future is no excuse for not expanding the supply chain to all humanity, right? The fact that something is hard is not a reason not to do it. It's just something you gotta understand. So what GOSCOS has done, and you can go look it up yourself, uh, GOSCOS stands for Global Open Source Quality Assurance System, is build a software system that requires no authentication. You do not have to give your name. You don't have to give your email. You don't have to give any identifying information. And you can practically use it. It's workable right now. We have a minimum viable product to produce a QR code that can be placed on a medical device or some other device like a box like this, which allows this box to be tracked through time and space. And we use the word provenance for that. Provenance is usually used in the United States to mean the history of an art object, where a Picasso has hung, for example, you know, so that you, you know that the thing is, is authentic. The provenance of an art object is one of the main ways we fight counterfeiting of art objects. And it's going to be one of the main ways we fight counterfeiting of medical objects and other parts of the supply chain as well. So I'm almost done. I would like to talk about the vision. And again, we're using the word Plan C right now. It's not the greatest um, name for this. Dale Doherty came up with this name at the height of the pandemic. Um, and what he meant was, you know, plan A was the normal distribution channels. 
plan B was the government distribution channels and plan C was the maker movement. What we want to do is to create an army and that word by itself may not be the best word. Uh, what we want to do is to create a loosely organized, quickly deployable group of makers organized into a logistical core that can operate globally. It should be ubiquitous to basic needs. We should be able to supply basic needs anywhere in the world. And we want to have a place for every volunteer. What we want to do is build a system where anyone who says, I would like to volunteer to be a part of Plan C, there will be something useful for you to do. Now, not everyone is a maker. Not everyone has a 3D printer or CNC machine or a laser cutter, um, but still everyone has something to offer if the leadership of Plan C can organize it a way for them to fit in. And that's part of our responsibility. And we want it to be what's called inflatable. That word may not make sense to much of this audience, um, but it's the idea that it can very quickly grow to a large size and then it can shrink very quickly. We're not trying to compete with normal factories in the normal supply chain. The value of what we're doing here is when this normal supply chain is disrupted, which the pandemic really pushed home to us. But there are lots of other examples where the supply chain is, is disrupted. So we're not imagining that a maker in their little homestead or a small engineering firm that's been disemployed because of a recession, but still has a bunch of tools in their workshop, um, is going to be able to make products as efficiently as a gigantic factory in China or a car factory in Detroit or a, a clothing factory in Vietnam or um, a, a, a toy factory in Mexico. But they may still be useful, okay? And in this thing, um, we're not imagining it as either capitalistic or anti-capitalistic in the sense that we're not saying whether money is changing hands here or not, okay? So let's say there's another pandemic tomorrow, which could happen. In my opinion, the most, most terrifying two words in the world are starter pandemic, right? What if we had a starter pandemic? And now the real pandemic is gonna start, okay? Let's say the world needs more masks. Are you gonna buy those masks or masks gonna be given away? I don't know and I don't care, right? The people who participate in Plan C may choose to participate on the basis of getting money for the thing that they produce, or they may not. That will be determined on a case-by-case -case basis, right? Money may be changing hands in this, or it may not. It's, it's still the case that by building an inflatable fluid capability, we are only helping the world. If someone, if you know, you would always say, well, I at least want the capability of participating in this, even if I don't choose to participate in it. So what we're imagining is that this is going to use software systems, which are under construction right now. One is the Open Knowledge Framework, the OKFR, which includes particularly the Open Know How Recipe or Instruction System and the Open Know Where Maker or Manufacturing Shop Description System that Harry Pearson has worked on, and Global Distributed Tracking, which is the MVP that I just described. Um, now, I would love it if someone would come up with a better name than Plan C. Dale Doherty created Plan C. It made sense. I personally think of this as like Dumbledore's army from Harry Potter, where you have this kind of underground um, guardians of good who are trying to fight the dark forces by being ready to swing into action. But they're not actually official. And they're not in, the, in those books. They're not associated with the Ministry of Magic because the Ministry of Magic has been corrupted. Another idea would be to call it the Supply Chain Core. Um, that is not a very glamorous name. Uh, 11 years ago, I wrote an essay where I, I described an American Rescue Corps 
uh, as an idea, um, but we're we're open to better names. So that ends my talk, and uh, I'd really like to um, hear your thoughts on this. And uh, I'm sorry if I've taken too long. I haven't even been looking at the clock. Um, thank you all for attending. So basically what this project is trying to do is one of uh, one or two of the key points in our policy recommendations in Design Make Protect, the OSMS white paper, where we recommended that the maker network within the United States be formalized and receive support. So if they were needed again, there would be an infrastructure in place where they could not only be successful um, on a grand scale, but they could be, you know, be supported. And we recommended that um, designs be housed in an easily accessible database. Um, basically, this this rapid response network would uh, be acknowledged and be ready to work again if needed. And of course, no one from a top-down uh, way has done anything like that. But I see this as, uh, you know, we're trying to make that happen. And this just tells me that that network will be needed. When, it's hard to say, but it will be. Right. A rapid response network is a pretty good name for it. Uh, Forrest Erickson has suggested the material mob or materials militia. Um, so we, we, we actually, uh, actually probably be, I think in our white paper was something more like citizen response network, because we need to remember that the people that helped make the the maker space, you know, independent PPE manufacturing so successful, were not just makers themselves. There were, yes, people doing the production, but people who never laid a hand on a 3D printer or a laser cutter were as important as those people in getting this stuff to the place. People with all sorts of skills, um, research capability, networks of their own made the response you know, powerful. So I think a, a citizen response network doesn't limit it to just maker. It it lets you feel like you can be part of that movement if you have a skill um, and the desire to be part of it. Right. You know, um, I personally am a researcher. Research people are my people. I love researchers. But we're only the first step in the supply chain. We're no more important than someone stocking a shelf or handing out a box on the front lines, you know. And everybody along the entire supply chain is important and necessary and has a place. So this is, a, it's an open source research problem, but it's also a software problem, a financing problem, an organization problem, a marketing problem, a communications problem, a leadership problem, a fellowship problem. Um, it's, you know, and, and all of the skills that you need, for example, to work in a disaster area is also a problem. Uh, thank you, Earl. Yeah, I'm just going to put our white paper here in the chat and the policy recommendations are uh, this this conversation starts on page 76 uh, of 98 and I co-wrote a lot of that language so I think um, another situation we have is we have a lot of small and well-meaning organizations that are trying to solve this problem and uh, doing very well at it and knowing how all these pieces fit together and become highly scalable is kind of where we are right now. Um, 
I do think we're going to be at a point where these these small efforts um, will become really important, even if just on a hyperlocal basis. Well, I agree. Uh, I think you'd agree if if we had the 2020 pandemic to do over again, we would be a lot better at it now. But, you know, we need to carry that spirit forward. And the thing that we can do in the short term is supply chain drills where we're practicing and developing our approach and it, making our tools better and better by actually utilizing them. And so that's kind of the focus that um, Harry Pearson and James Butler and I uh, working at Project Data have uh, for this. And there's already a lot of hyper-local or even national uh, agent response networks like this. I'm thinking of the mutual aid community. Um, there's a lot of distributed networks who are trying to be the people on the ground that respond when something happens. Uh, for instance, mutual aid networks will travel to states very far away if there's a disaster and they want to help. That type of uh, incentive already exists, but I see these type of like matching systems and uh, software as helping build some infrastructure for those uh, networks and also preventing silos between organizations. Yeah, well, so one thing that, that we're trying to do is to work with as many organizations as possible. So for example, we're building on and working closely with the IOPA formats rather than creating new formats. And so helpful engineering, open source medical supplies and IOPA and public invention are all already informally allied um, in this process. But there are probably lots of situations where we could um, do it, bring more uh, nonprofits or or for profits or universities into um, in into this uh, idea. Have you talked to any for profits? No. The startup space is so crowded with people trying to find the next, you know, Uber that public infrastructure projects like this uh, really don't get as much noise as they should. Well, I think that there's a lot of opportunity in the um, in either like aligned or semi semi aligned organizations. Um, there's a lot of People like, especially for crowd supply, for example, would be a great example of an organization that is dedicated towards like commercial based products that are open source that are at least tangentially aligned with the, the mission statement you're producing. And I don't know why you haven't talked to them yet. So, well, a huge a, important part of this work is uh, working with our network to understand the external partners that we could be connected to. What ones would you be recommending? Uh, I, I mean, Crowd Supply would be a good place to start, um, mostly because they've got a large number of um, um, like uh, sympathetic projects that are uh, either they're, they're scaled from everywhere from like a small one man, two man, or one person, two person um, company to like a, a, a group of like tens or 20 um, like larger companies. Um, there's also a the, there's actually a really interesting problem in the in the open source space where you have a 
bunch of um, um, different people making very similar products, um, but there's not a really a, a way of organizing those products in a way that's um, seamless for the consumer standpoint. Um, so I think that I think the this is a really interesting technology, and I think it's a really interesting space. But until you've got a, a, a reason for somebody to use it day in, day out, it won't get exercised to the point where um, it'll be useful in a pandemic or another emergency situation. Um, to, to bring back a reference that I think Lee pointed out in the, in the comments, I think is very relevant. The reason why the amateur radio um, core has a component, uh, has a public service component and why it's functional and useful is because it has a constant use outside of the emergency component. If you relied only on the emergency component of the uh, of the um, of the volunteer network that the amateur radio community provides, I think that the system would not be nearly as robust as it currently is. So I'd encourage looking for ways of, of finding ways of keeping this used and in practice well and above and beyond um, emergencies. So Anil Patney is here, whom I've never met before. Anil, do you want to uh, add to this conversation uh, vocally? You've already put something in the chat. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say, yeah, this sounds amazing. I don't think I've um, been to one of these um, events before, but um, I've been a hacker and a maker for two decades now, uh, planning and organizing maker fairs and hackathons. I feel like this is really um, a model that we need to support and explore further. And it, it's never been there like historically for all of the individuals that were challenged with the traditional learning systems and approaches. And I feel like this is really a model that can help uh, solve and address many of the challenges we're facing now and in the future. And uh, I've built networks around the world and, you know, been uh, producing events and part of the uh, outreach efforts to um, build micro communities and try to figure out how can we um, figure out <laughs> solutions to this. And um, it's a whole new type of lifestyle being a I'm calling it like a futurist essentially where you're part nomadic but you get to work in your own terms in the own in your own um passionate projects and um you get to develop them and in, in parallel and uh you know being control of your destiny in a way that you know has not been part of an an option uh before and you know it's exciting uh for the people that take that journey and try to do something for themselves and make a difference and it's something socially impactful and you know just uh um have the resources to support and um allow uh, for that and, and you know um uh, this is really like the puzzle pieces that i've been trying to solve and now the financial piece of like how do we um, have funds to do this um, but I'm here in Austin now I've been here eight years and I'm building a tiny house live work community event space which kind of ties a lot of these hacker maker community members in a space where we can kind of connect them and all of these resources to keep pushing these uh uh, efforts forward and really uh, it's more of a it's a fundraising campaign now and I'm, I'm really excited because it's the transition into a real our real vision of a physical space of what a hacker space that hosts like hackers and makers and uh, um, and uh, they get to build projects together and uh, all kinds of innovation activities so you know this is something revolutionary and is going to be here in Austin in the future. And I'd love to invite everybody. If you're ever here in Austin, I uh, want to come and see it, want to come and be part of it. Want to have ideas of, for projects you want to build there. Like uh, I'd love to discuss that further, but I'd love to partner and support and collaborate with this organization and, uh, you know, uh, and, and help see it excel and, um reach its uh, uh, objectives too and 
um yeah so, so tinyhackerhouse.com uh, that's my website my campaign and uh, it's also my email address if you need to reach me thank you guys so much well thank you maybe you can help us run a supply chain drill which is the thing that we we would really like to do you know one thing that that you said really resonates with me in terms of what we're trying to do here right for a long time the world has has recognized the need to help people in a disaster it's it's always been done informally by neighbors right it, it may it happens all the time we don't even think about it right and it always has and it always will but a larger and larger organizations have been created you know the red cross is is highly skilled at dealing with emergencies there there are other emergency um you know organizations the red crescent and so forth but one thing that you said was, you know, we would like to give everybody, and that could be every maker, every volunteer, every business person, every marketer, a way to participate and help in the case of an emergency or disrupted supply chain. And those people deserve a way to help and fit into this in, a, in as much as the people who need something deserve to be helped. And that's why the it's kind of like the matching problem or the organization problem is a problem that needs to be solved because there are lots and lots of people who want to help. There are lots and lots of people who need help. We just need to get them together. Um, and I, I, I and Miriam and Joe are the only people who live in Austin on this call right now, but um, I'll be looking you up, Anil, and, and you can send me a uh, email as well. Um, and Neil, how did you learn about this meeting? Um, this is a great question. I'm not 100% sure, but I try to be part of every uh, group and forum and organization that is you know, related and aligned to this um, uh, futuristic endeavor and effort. Um, and I think this one popped up on my radar and it sounded very like aligned with this mission. And I, I was excited to just see that you had an upcoming event and just uh, managed to make it <laughs> while uh, sitting in my car. But uh, yeah, um, I, I also wanted to share one other thing that um, since, you know, as part of this maker movement that um, and tiny house movement and uh, hacker movement is uh, one of the projects that we came up with a couple of years pre-pandemic was we were trying to figure out how do we solve for like affordable housing, right? And, um, you know, how about if we had a product that, you know, um, ended up being a geodesic dome structure that uh, we 3D modeled, designed and uh, made on a CNC machine. And uh, it's a series of hexagons and pentagons uh connected together and uh it's like a giant soccer ball um uh, but it's about 13 feet tall and we made two of them i think the other one was like uh eight feet tall uh like prototypes and um and uh it was made out of a material called dye bond and it's uh, aluminum composite material and uh we um uh, you know we took it <laughs> on a truck and uh, cross country to Burning Man and built the dome and lit it up with LEDs in the middle of the desert. And uh, it was an exciting journey into, you know, trying to create this shelter, but in the middle of a desert and seeing how it would survive the test of time and the environment. Um, but, you know, these are the kind of activities I'd love to see more of. And, you know, this is maybe the start of a uh, an effort to figure out, like, where does this, uh, you know, all these challenges, how can we create temporary spaces where uh, we can, you know, support this, uh, these efforts and relief for places that need it. Um, two other organizations I wanted to mention is the, uh, Burners Without Borders and Engineers Without Borders. I'm part of these two groups here in Austin. And, uh, you know, they do a lot of these disaster relief uh, efforts for when there's FEMA and flooding and uh, natural disasters. And, um, you know, they've done a lot of amazing work to 
um, remove the bottlenecks in a lot of these uh, systemic disaster relief efforts that, um, you know, extend the time of getting relief to the people that need it. And, um, you know, it's they're great organizations you should uh, also connect with because, you know, they've uh, just so much to learn from them too. And they're actively doing projects too. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm a member of the Greater Austin Chapter of Engineers Without Borders and also a Texas State Representative of the Steering Committee for the South Central Region of Engineers Without Borders. So I work very closely with them and I've been on release missions to Puerto Rico and uh, am working on a water delivery project in Tanzania right now. Um, Engineers Without Borders focuses on civil engineering which is not really what public invention and open source medical supplies do, which focus more on global health. Um, but it, it, it's pop, we can we can forge all of these things together and learn from everybody uh, in terms of doing these things. Okay, well, I wouldn't mind hearing from someone we haven't heard from already. Uh, if anyone has any further questions, perhaps we're winding down here, if not. Uh oh, <clears throat> excuse me, Forrest Lee Erickson here. Robert, you mentioned how the patent office is the source of uh, a growing body of knowledge. And in a conversation you and I and probably Lawrence had some time ago, I talked about how when the pandemic struck, I was spending time that April trying to figure out if there were electronic assemblies that my then employer could make for the ventilator effort and was just not successful. Um, and it was sometime later I thought, oh, man, I didn't think to go back and look for expired patents. Um, because obviously there were ventilators 20 years ago, the patents on those things, they're expired and they would form potentially a design. Perhaps it would be an interesting exercise to say, let's pretend it's April of 2020 and let's for real research, learn what we, as a practice, try and learn what we can out of the patent system, uh, as an exercise. Um, almost like real time, meaning, um, we start in saying, we don't know, and we just start searching and say, what well, can we find in half an hour worth of searching for candidates that we would then say, all right, if, if we're really doing this, uh, and there were half a dozen of us, we find six good candidates to research that then we would have hypothetically followed up on and maybe report back and say, yeah, I think we can do something with this. That's a very interesting idea. You know, that's an extension of the supply chain I drill that the supply chain drill idea that I had not imagined. So you would be adding a research component at the beginning of the supply chain drill, um, which is certainly um, possible. I could I could discuss some things about the patent office from my own searches, but I think it would kill the conversation if I if I went there right now. So we should discuss that in a separate meeting. I think. I would say, yeah, it should be a special purpose meeting for people who are interested in that. And I, I chose ventilator because I'm, it's still a sore point with me that I couldn't find something that my employer could do at that time for like the control systems of, but yeah, you know, there, there's probably gotta be other stuff uh, like that. Uh, you know, more, maybe more general medical equipment, um, and then people, yeah, and I, I approached it from an electronic assembly point of view because that's my expertise and my employer's capabilities. But, you know, for someone whose employer was a machine shop or uh, sewed fabric things, there would be, you know, similar kinds of things to say, all right, let's research. Right. Right. Well, you know, I think we, what the world really needs right now is some leadership in producing 
what you could call exercises or drills that move closer and closer to reality. And we need to do more what some people in this meeting have done. Christine and Victoria really, truly delivered, what was it, 51 million pieces of personal protective equipment. Of course, they didn't do it each by hand, but they organized those efforts um, You know, for a lot of people to do it. And that is the part that researchers like myself often ignore. And it cannot be morally ignored anymore. You, you can't just say, I'm going to research something, even like a geodesic dome, although I love geodesic domes, right? And say, it's enough to build an open source design. Because most people don't look at open source designs, right? It's very easy to make a design that no one is ever going to look at. I've probably made 50 of them or 20 of them, right? What we have to do is to, to do the less pleasant and harder work of building a supply chain that really truly delivers human benefit to real human beings. We have to we have to think holistically of the entire solution. But I think I think we we can do that and we're forging links that allow that to be done. I think also a huge part of this is being able to design something for manufacture which is vastly different from designing something that can be made by one or two people. Right. Um, small spaces will only be able to make X amount and scaled manufacturing obviously can make more. And I think those scale designs are a really important part of this component. The problem is how do you know what's going to be important to scale. Um, certainly everyone thought ventilators were going to be the thing. And um, I remember that Medtronic released a whole package of specs for a ventilator. They said they opened it, but a lot of critical information was missing, Rob. Yeah, exactly. So um, it, it gets very complex. Um, I, I know that some makerspaces were able to make some uh, fitter connectors that were uh, unfindable in the early months. Those, those we have in our library. There was a point where uh, we thought there was going to be a shortage of HME valves, which are humidity, moisture, exhalation valves that go um, kind of like there are connection for it on a ventilator. Really critical small part, very small part, like maybe as big as 50 cent piece. Um, but hospitals would need thousands of those. And by thousands, like 50,000, like one order, 50,000. Makerspace isn't be able to make those. You have to, you have to be able to scale that. So the, we're talking about covering an enormous variety of asks and it can be hard to anticipate what that means in terms of deliverables. That's right. But of course, that what small makers and a, a loosely a loose federation of a large number of people can do is they can have a great fluidity and adaptability and resilience to meet an on-spot demand that could not be predicted ahead of time. If you can predict the head of time, the demand, then for-profit companies are very good at filling that demand. Uh, it's This makes more sense when the demand is either so dynamic due to what we would think of as disasters or for some other reason, um, that it makes makes sense to perform it in, in this way. Um, but it's a solvable problem, right? It requires some software and it requires some human ingenuity, but it's not an impossible problem. And then the vision you know, we can have is when there's a global need, which you know, there is every month, there's a new global need. Um, 327 million people in America can theoretically become part of that solution. And it's easy for them to do so. They come to some place and say, how can I be part of the solution? And 
they say, well, what, what do you have to offer? And they enumerate what they're good at and what they're capable of doing. And then they get to work because they, they've got a plan for how to do that. In this way, we could save a lot of lives and we could raise the bar, I think, on expectations globally uh, about what we, we are able to do and what we should do for people. You know, if we can provide drinking water for people because of a tsunami or an earthquake, we can also provide clean drinking water to impoverished people who don't have it because um, because of a chronic problem instead of an acute problem. Victoria, I'd be hearing, I'd be interested in hearing sometime a little bit more about uh, uh, the scaling issues you were talking about and uh, whether there is uh, new technology beyond the range of uh, uh, individual makers uh, that uh, uh, makers or our level of uh, uh, effort perhaps could contribute to uh, um, bringing that technology to bear or, or finding the the uh, uh, the uh, for-profit firms uh, that could, with assistance, uh, address that, but perhaps don't have the information uh, uh, that even brought it to their attention. They're not, not necessarily for a conversation now, but that seems like an interesting topic to get into sometime. Thank you. Megan and I will make a note of that. And... Um um consider it uh i mean you know that's a bullet we have to bite right uh you know i hope that six months from now we're talking about doing supply chain drills where we're providing thousands of units of something but we have to recognize so far we've only made one box of cookies right we really need to take the next step and I really believe the way you go fast is by taking baby steps as fast as you can. We need to we need to do the next supply chain drill of modest scale as quickly as we possibly can. And Project Data is in fact working on that, of helpful engineering, by the way. I think you should also pick something that's easier or something that's like, uh, or maybe pick up something that's like, um, like more relevant um, or more top of mind for people. Um, I, I think of like, um, like right now I'm dealing with like supply chain issues with, with billing and financing and trying to just get product to people. And it is a, it is a billion dollar problem. Um, and so I think that by limiting it by, to just the things that people are willing to donate their time to, I think you're limiting the opportunity to, uh, to, to be able to do more in the short run. And then when we need it for the long run, um, it'll be available. Well, I mean, we're hardly turning anybody away. You know, ev everything we do is completely open source. For-profit firms are welcome to take global distributed tracking. They can use it now, or they can take the code and use the code, build their own system. We're not preventing anybody from doing anything. Uh, so I'm not exactly sure how else to respond to your question. Okay, well, it's been an hour and 15 minutes, and um, we often sort of stop at this point. Um, so uh, let me just ask, if, uh, let me just repeat. This is the third Thursday Inventors Gathering. We always have something like this. A lot of times we have guest speakers. Um, it's not always just me speaking. Uh, and so there'll be another one um, next Thursday uh, in February. I think it's February 15th will be uh, the third Thursday of that month. And so um, thank you all for coming. You can always contact Public Invention, Helpful Engineering, Open Source Medical Supplies. My name is Robert L. Reed. My uh, email address is read.robert at gmail.com. Um, I'm the leader of Public Invention, and thank you very much. <laughs>